We're here at Papadakis Racing with Steph Papadakis, and we're really lucky because Steph is going to show us all around Frederick Osbo's new car. And um, I, I'm secretly doing this because a lot of you guys know that I'm an engineer for another team, and this is m the way I'm going to spy on their car. Right, Steph? No problem. We want to be as uh, transparent as we can with the build. What's, what's new in the engine development for this year, Steph? I know last year you were working on um, some stuff like billet main caps and uh, uh, shaft rock or valve train to help the reliability. And I see you have a lot of cool CNC parts now and your packaging is a lot tighter. Um, do you have any uh, things you want to talk about? So as far as engine wise this year, um, there's not a whole bunch of changes because the chassis is all new mm -hmm. and we had to design all new suspension and everything. We tried to have as much carryover as we could from last year because none of the car did. Um, so the engine and stuff that we ran this year was actually the spare engine from last year. So uh, for Long Beach it was it was the same. Oh okay. I, I guess maybe some of the peripheral details like the CNC motor mount, the motor plate, uh, maybe a bunch of little things are different but it, it's like really cool. Yeah so we could talk about that. So like the long block itself was the same. Okay. But like we did, yeah, new engine mounts, uh, new motor plate. Um, of course, all, all everything is built again because the IM that we ran last year is still totally complete. Uh, so we actually had to build an entire new car, uh, but we were able to use some of the spare parts from the last car, so like the engine. But yeah, the turbo manifold, full race, built us a full new header. We tried something a little bit different. Osbo thought that if we did a, a two to one wastegate, like it would sound better, mm -hmm. but it seemed to sound the same. Oh, okay. But it looked something, you know, something different. And uh, we went with red powder coated pipes this time, you know, just something a little bit different. By going to the rear motor plate, uh -huh. um, are, you, are you using the engine as a stress member and does the motor plate uh, help with distortion on the block with all the power you're making and, and, and things like that? So as far as the motor plate goes, it, it does a couple of jobs. It adapts our uh, Toyota 2AR engine to a small block Chevy bell housing. So it does oh, that bolt pattern okay. um, adapt, adaption and then it mounts to the frames and that actually helps strengthen the frame a bit mm -hmm. and it's very solid the engine to the chassis. We try actually not to use the engine as a stress member because it was never designed like that from the factory and if you have the engine wrapping up in some way you can start closing up some of those really tight clearances like in the main bearings. The way you did it is really smart like coupling the mount with the bell housing and everything because that's a really beefy part of the block to like couple I think. Yeah, that comes from uh, our drag racing experience. Most drag cars are built with a motor plate like that. Oh, okay. Um, it's, it's amazing how uh, tidy everything is and all the CNC stuff and all the, uh, it's all d done in house and you designed all these parts? Uh, it's a collaboration of everybody in the shop for as far as the design, um, but pretty much all of us started as mechanics before we were fabricators. So as we've been as we design the stuff to be fabricated, we know that we're personally going to have to work on it, so we have to make it easy to work on. So that's always on the front end. Fabricators I've worked with, they really want to make beautiful stuff, and a lot of the time they're artists, and they do make really beautiful stuff, but uh, sometimes that could be at the compromise of, of being easy to work on. Yeah, and I know you guys could perform the fastest engine changes of all, all the teams in FD. I, I mean, I've seen you guys totally swap a motor in less than 45 minutes before. Yeah, ideally we wouldn't be swapping motors, um, but we're at the point with these four cylinders to where we're reaching the limits of like the actual castings of the cylinder head and stuff. So we we do pins. I'll, I can show you some stuff later on, on the on the bench of what we do. Okay, um, like um, I, I uh, do. You guys do rapid prototyping uh, for some of your parts before you actually cut them in aluminum to test fit things. Yep, so the way that we'll, the process is we'll know a part that we want to make. So let's say it's, uh, let, let's say it's a, a, a this front motor mount, mm -hmm. right? And so the front motor mount, we know where it needs to land on both ends. And I'll kind of sketch out like how it might, might look and write down a couple of dimensions on my notepad and then get inspired. Maybe go look at some pictures on the internet, you know, Google search for like billet motor mounts or something and maybe some cars that I've seen and then start drawing it up and we'll do the CAD design and then like you said we'll 3D print it and make sure it fits properly on the car and then we can do changes if need be and then we can actually go and machine it at that point. So it cuts a whole step out of 
um, we can develop stuff so much quicker by 3D printing it first. And, uh, and now we can actually, because we can see and see everything in the house, we can mm -hmm. go from like the full paper napkin, like sketched idea all the way to a final product here at, within the shop. I'm really envious of that too. I wish our team had that capability where we didn't have to farm that stuff out. Cause I'd like to get away from things like fabricated uprights and all that. And I mean, I mean your car is uh, billet CNC uprights and they're beautiful. And I, I'm super envious of that. <laughs> Yeah, some of the stuff is fabricated, um, like some of the more complicated stuff to make on a CNC because we only have a three axis. Mm -hmm. And if it's larger and kind of like these weird angles, we'll probably fabricate it. But if it's mostly like 2.5D, which is, you know, as long as we don't have to refixture it and build all kinds of crazy fixtures, we'll, we'll CNC it, especially if we're making several of them because, you know, once you have it designed, you can, you know, just keep building more of them and they're all the same uh, and not have to build elaborate you know, welding fixtures. Right, so in a way, uh, it actually saves time and money because you don't have to have such, uh, when you make your spare set, like so much handwork in it and everything. Yep, and there's not like that magic set that somehow fits better than another. Right, and we all know about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so engine development's kind of the same. Um, your suspension stuff is, um, um, really cleaned up. I noticed you're not running a front sway bar in this car. Yeah, we haven't for the last couple cars. We've gotten away from it, and that was as we fixed, uh, as we've gone higher with the roll center in the front, uh, we've gotten away from running front sway bars. So the high roll center kind of uh, reduces the need to, to have it. Correct, that's what we found. Oh, uh, that's one of the things that we've done too, is uh, screwed around a lot with roll center height, but. We still run the bar because we feel like it works good in transitions and stuff. Right, and that could be driver preference a little bit. Freddie really likes a lot of front end grip. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever we put the sway bar on the front, he'd be like, yeah, the steering feedback feels better, but you know, he didn't like the reduced front grip. Oh, okay. Um, so we'll play a little bit with ride height, which changes that roll center height. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we've gone with larger front tires. We were running 245 wide tires and now we run the 265. Oh, that's 265 the same as time. us, right. Yep. I, I, I guess- well, we run a, only a 275 rear. Oh, okay. So how much horsepower does this engine make uh, just on the turbo and how much is, it, is the nitrous add? Yep, so we make 850 horsepower just on the turbo and that's at 28 pounds of boost. And then uh, on top of that, we have 150 shot of nitrous. Mm -hmm. And the smaller tracks, what we used to do is once it hit like 26 pounds of boost, the nitrous would turn back off. Uh, but now we just leave it on for most tracks and we just turn it off at, I think it's like 7,500 RPM. And the red line on the engine now is uh, 9,000. Okay. So we just, what we're trying to do is the driver can get into it. So the, the nitrous is all automatic. He just arms it. And in the background, the software is just waiting for him to get past 80% throttle. Once he gets past 80% throttle, the nitrous kicks on. And then once it gets to 7,500 RPM, it shuts back off again because we figure once he's over 7,500 RPM, that means he has the wheel speed that he wants. Um, and then if it drops below 7,500, it'll turn back on again. I mean, one of the things I always felt is um, your engine has the most incredible power density of any of the power plants in FD. I mean, for the size and weight, uh, you produce more power than, I, I mean, most racing engines even. Uh, and I, I think that's incredible. And do you feel that the uh, compactness and the weight of this engine gives you a pretty good advantage in handling, for instance? For the chassis that we've been running, which are these front wheel drive chassis that we convert to rear wheel drive, the downside of them is they're a cab forward design. So the firewall and everything is really far forward. The axle center line, right? Mm -hmm. um, the firewall is only eight inches far farther back from the axle center line, or five, uh, eight inches setback from the axle center line. So any kind of like V8 or, or inline six or something would have so much of the engine sticking in front of the front axle. Uh, you'd have a lot of front end bias, but you'd also have an issue with just so much front weight over the in front of the front axle, and it makes typically a poorly handling car. And this engine is lightweight, so we're able to, to get away around that a little bit. The engine is still mostly in front of the front axle, but it's not that heavy, so it's not that big of a deal. So I'm gonna do a plug for Steph's engines. So if you, any of you people that race other classes, like if you need a really light, really compact engine with really good power density, 
you got to see stiff. It also has really good reliability. So like, let's say maybe you're doing some, like a prototype or something, or you, you could always get away with like less weight and less size. Come see Steph, he could hook you up. This engine is awesome. I mean, um, I'm kind of looking for a project where I can use one of these. It's really impressive. Well, we'll look at the, the insides a little bit more later. So is there anything in the inside you want to show us? Sure, yeah, let's go. So this build is typical of the, the cars that we, we build. Is th these are stripped down to nothing, like actually a bare shell. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have it chemical dipped so there's no more paint, undercoating, anything left on, on the vehicle. And we don't use really much of the stock components as far as like we replace the pedal assembly, the steering column. Um, there's no heating or air conditioning, obviously. We do use the stock dash because we try to keep you know, some of the, the Corolla styling. So then we fabricate all of the pedal mounts and all of the cage and everything. And then uh, as far as the rules go, what allows us to make this car rear wheel drive is the rules allow for a certain dimension hole to be cut in the firewall to allow bell housing clearance mm -hmm. on any vehicle, um, just for reliability sake. And then you can also uh, cut the floorboard and create a, a tunnel for the transmission and drive shaft. So if you look into the car, you can see the large, um, tunnel that's now in the in the chassis for the transmission in the in the drive shaft and I see you use a tilt and pedal box yeah we use the 600 series pedals um, you know dual master cylinders for the brake and then the traditional uh, just single master for the clutch and then uh, we use a drive-by-wire uh, throttle pedal okay it's actually out of a I think like a, a 2002 Camry okay it has a really stiff return spring and they've been really reliable. And then that gets fed into the AEM Infinity system. And then we use a, actually a Subaru, a 60 millimeter, quite small, uh, 60 millimeter throttle body for the engine. Oh wow, that's a really small throttle body. Is, yeah. there, is there a reason why you're using something so small? Yep, we found that on this application, these high boosted cars, the larger throttle bodies don't actually make any more power. Mm -hmm. They only make it hard to modulate the throttle. Oh, so we okay. run as small of a throttle body as we can get away with. That way when he lets off the throttle, there's a reduction in power. With the large throttle bodies, you can run into an issue where, you know, you have to, you'll make the maximum power, let's say your car makes 800 horsepower, you'll make 800 horsepower 40% throttle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we've actually had dyno tests where we'll, we'll, we'll run at different, like every 10% throttle, and uh, we'll see what the horsepower is. That is actually a, a really good thing. Like we experimented with ITBs, and they have like a lot of throttle area, and we actually found that the, the same thing, like the modulation wasn't there and um, it looked cool, so it was kind of sucked to get rid of it, but. And, and with a drive-by-wire setup, you know, in, in the Infinity, you can program whatever throttle cam you want. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be linear. Um, so, you know, some time on the dyno and at the track, you can find something that works really well for the driver, which is, at the end of the day, you know, it, so much comes down to the driver and drift anyway. We, we just need to make a car that's reliable, that's really comfortable for the driver, mm -hmm. and that typically nets better results than the, the trickiest, craziest build. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, um, this is a pretty trick crazy build, though, you gotta admit. <laughs> <laughs> um, what kind of transmission are you running? We run, we run the G-Force GSR transmission. Okay. So it's a you know, four-speed dog box, uh, but still an H pattern. Frederick likes the, the H pattern. And there's, because it's American made and there's tons of parts available from NASCAR, uh, because they sell it to NASCAR, there's tons of gear ratios available mm -hmm. and parts available. So we run a Supra rear end mm -hmm. and we only have two ratios. We run a 427 or a 377. We do most of our gear ratio changes actually in the transmission. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that helps with having the best compromises for gearing around the whole track. So that's why you're not running a quick change, like which is the trend in Formula Drift nowadays. And, and I guess the uh, super rear end saves a lot of weight too, right? Yeah, the super end is, is lighter weight, um, which we're concerned about with the four-door car. It's already a heavy car and we're always overweight. Um, and it has more ground clearance. Uh, we work with Toyota, so we actually can get those from Toyota. Okay. Uh, so that helps on budget as well. Uh, and, and uh, They've been really reliable, so it's a good combination. What kind of differential do you use in there? So we run a spool type differential, okay. but nobody makes a spool for this smaller Supra diff that we run. So we actually take the stock Toyota LSD and we machine a bunch of 
uh, we machine it to accept dowel pins in it, and okay. we it reassemble it so it, it locks the LSD together. Okay. So it's all the factory components, but modified to act solid. Okay. What kind of clutch do you run? We run a Tilton four disc. Oh, a four a, disc. Yep. A, Seven and a quarter inch four okay. disc, uh, but non carbon. Okay. We run the traditional centered iron. Okay. Yep. And those that holds up pretty good. It's amazing reliability. Uh, Freddie's really hard on clutches, and he'll wear them out in a, a weekend and a half. Mm -hmm. So we're always putting parts into it. Uh, but if we had ran like a carbon clutch or something, it wouldn't even make it through a weekend because as they wear, the adjustment changes yeah, so quickly. Yeah, the air and, gap changes. And yeah. You lose clamp yep. fast. Exactly. So the the this clutch has been very good to us. I see you've gone to StopTech this year as your brake supplier. Uh, what, how do you like it? StopTech's amazing. Like we knew we needed a new brake supplier this year, and uh, I reached out to Steve Ruiz, which is the head engineer over there. You probably mm -hmm. know Steve. And within like the next 24 hours, he and his other engineer were up at the shop looking at the new build. And, and within like a few days, they specced out the brakes that we could use. They have a whole line of sprint car brakes, mm -hmm. which are actually the rotors we use are vented, but they're actually lighter than the non-vented like Willwood uh, okay. rotors that we used to use. And so they're more robust, um, although we don't put much heat into them. And then they supplied us with these crazy five axis machined calipers that are, you know, four and a half pounds each. So they're super lightweight. They're really stiff, which we need uh, for driver feel. Mm -hmm. um, so when he hits the foot front brake and wants to, let's say, lock up the brakes or pull the handbrake, it's you get it immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was really good. And they're manufactured locally here in California as well. So they were uh, easy to get and yeah, easy to work with. The hard part was there is no, so they have, they have supply the rotors and the calipers and the pads, but there is no way to bolt them on. So we have to manufacture the hats uh, and then the caliper brackets all here, but we can do that. So that's not a problem. Um, I noticed in the back of the car, um, some of your packaging is a lot different. Like uh, now you're mounting the radiator horizontally. Is that to get the center of gravity lower and get better weight distribution? Exactly. So the radiator's in the back to get better weight distribution. We try to keep it in front of the rear axle, mm -hmm. right? But still call it midship. Um, and then as low as possible. So we try to run it. It's almost flat. It's tilted a little bit just to make sure bleed the air, air can bleed. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but we try to get that as low as we could. And then also the nitrous bottle is mounted super low behind the, the passenger seat to try to get the CG lower for that as well. Oh, or the CG lower for the car. Yeah. Where's your uh, dry sump located? So the dry sump is well, actually... I mean, a uh, uh, tank. Yep. So the dry sump tank is actually in a false firewall up in the front of the car. The issue we have had is if you have an engine problem and let's say there's bearing material that goes through the, mm -hmm. the, the oiling system and when you have a rear mounted dry sump tank, you've got to clean all of those lines. Right. And that can take a long time and it's kind of a hassle. So what we did was we tried to fit the dry sump tank under the hood and on the engine like the drag cars do, mm -hmm. um, but we weren't able to fit it. So the next best thing was mounting it actually inside the car against the firewall, uh, which is what we did. And then we built a whole like called secondary firewall around the dry sump tank. I really like the, your uh, rear bay packaging. That's that's a lot of thought went into that and that's pretty cool. Yeah, and even just, even just the fuel cell, like we try to make some pretty stuff too, like the fuel cell, we anodized it red to try to match some stuff. And then we have these laser cut uh, brackets that hold the fuel cell into its little fuel cell cage. And then the, the rear um, sway bar, it's always hard to mount the sway bars in these cars, uh, but we were able to figure it out. We figured out we could mount it up inside the trunk here, mm -hmm. and then we run the, the, the arms down through the unibody. That's a Speedway Engineering? Yep, so Speedway Engineering makes a bunch of different uh, diameters and thickness sway bars, and they actually have a universal arm Mm -hmm. And then it's like super long, so we cut it down and drill holes wherever we need it. And I see you have uh, holes in the unibody so you can swap out bars real quick and everything's real accessible. Yeah, again, because we know we're going to have to work on it at some point. What about the rear suspension? I, I noticed that um, the geometry looks like it would work real well. Um, one of the things I noticed though is it looks like this uh, suspension has like a lot of passive toe in under load. Um, and that's probably part of the original geometry, but is that something you have to deal with? Like, does the car want to like tighten up as, as it takes a set because there's so much toe under, under roll? 
uh, if you consider this suspension as traditional sense, you may think it has a lot of toe in, mm -hmm. but it's not a standard four link or trailing arm. It's actually a five link. Mm -hmm. So it actually has no bump steer, no bump under under toe. Um, and and, oh, and wait, the reason that's, for that- That's, that's rigid. Oh, it doesn't art articulate it in that plane. It are, uh, okay, the, the trailing so, arm, yeah. So the trailing arm articulates here and it articulates here. Oh, okay. It's not fixed here, which is a better way of looking at this instead of saying, this upper control arm is so much shorter than the lower. Mm -hmm. If you think of this point where the front trailing arm is, this point and this point, they're in a similar line. So what happens is it actually arcs like this, but it's really trick. Like the suspension analyzer software that we have, we can't even, in, we can't even put it in because this is something that's so unique to this vehicle. I, I did not know it articulated there. Yep. That's why you get away from the toe change. Yeah, it's a really good suspension design. And we can change anti-squat just by changing the ride height of the car mm -hmm. because of the trailing arm configuration. And we can change uh, camber gain uh, just with a mount change. And uh, that's why if you look at the way this is designed, we can, we can actually change different brackets up at the top. And the geometry of that kind of prevents axle wind up too. Um, I mean, you get some arc here, just from the, the trailing arm wise, but it, it seems to work really well uh, for our application. That is really cool. I did not notice that. Yeah, the last few cars, the IM and the TC have that same design. Wow. This is updated a bit, so uh, some of the pickup points are, are different. And normally oh, we do have a spring on here. We've just been working on it a little bit today, cycling the suspension, but this is where the, the, the spring does go on the RSR coilover. So you're running RSRs front and rear? Yep. Are yep. they two or three way? They're two way. Front and rear? Uh, front and rear, two way. It's a it's a twin tube in the front, and then and then external reservoir here. Uh, do you do um, special valving or anything? Or yeah, RSR has a special setup for us. So we've been using the same physically designed shocks for since uh, the TC, and then we adapt the new car to work with those shocks. So the front the front strut is based on an S14, mm -hmm. a Nissan S14 because uh, they already had those designs and those everything. So we designed our own cup, custom top hat or pillow mount to adapt that and then our own upright. But it's a standard S14, call it shell or, or front strut. And in the rear is something that's more traditional, maybe racing where it just has a heim or a rod end on each side, top and bottom. And, um, and then we make that work within the application. Man, I'm super impressed, Steph. This whole car is superbly executed and very clean. Uh, the layout is very logical and uh, it looks, you know, easy to work on too and uh, very well thought out. Thanks. Yeah, we have the, it's a, it, it's a pain in the butt building new cars every year, but at the same time, we're able to continue to evolve that much quicker. We just, every time we learn, every time we build a new car, we learn. I know, I know for our team, we've been going through the same evolution. Like we've had the car's performance pretty good for the last three years, but every year we've been kind of refining and simplifying and making things easy to work on. And uh, I, I kind of understand all that um, and, and, and the um, methodology behind that and the reasons why, because it just saves time in the pits and in drifting, like time is everything. Like you got five minutes to fix the car sometimes. Yeah, and, that, and that's where it becomes harder as, you know, it's just that timing wise. So, um, yeah, make it as easy to work on as possible and carry a lot of spares. Who does your wiring harnesses? Greg Piles. Oh, so okay. he's built the harnesses for our cars for the last 10 years. And it's all Raychem and uh, Deutsch? It's all mill spec and Raychem, yeah. Oh, okay. And so all you people that are looking at this video and you want to build cars, you got to kind of look at what Steph does. Um, 80% of your failures in the competition car are usually related to wiring and plumbing issues. So it's almost to the point where you need to invest in your wiring and plumbing before you invest in making 20 more horsepower, for instance. It, it all pays off, right? Yeah, so there's a couple of tricks that we've learned. One is um, the way that we wire these is, is the, so we use the AEM Infinity for the engine. We use the AEM CD7 for the dash, mm -hmm. and then we use two MoTeC PDMs, which is their power distribution modules, one on the front of the car and then one on the rear. There's no fuses, there's no relays, um, none of that stuff that you can have issues with. It's all done through the MoTeC PDM, and everything talks to each other through the, the CAN bus system, mm -hmm. and the dash 
actually has a dual CAN bus. So we can log in that dash all the engine parameters from the ECU mm -hmm. and all of the power distribution information from the Motex. Mm -hmm. So we know the fuel pump amps, voltages, if there's any faults. We know when fans are turning on. So we can make sure everything's running well before the car runs. And then if there is a problem, bring out the laptop, download the log, and we can f usually diagnose really quickly as well. Uh, for those of you that don't know what a PDM is, it's a power distribution module, and it takes the place of all your fuses and relays, and um, it usually goes on a CAN bus, which is uh, multiplexing, so that means the single wire can carry a bunch of different signals from a bunch of different things because it's all discreetly encoded. So if you use a PDM, uh, you get rid of a lot of unreliable mechanical, electromechanical things, and you can really clean up your wiring and make it a lot simpler. Yeah, and, and if you look into the car, there's no switches or anything. There's a keypad, which is CAN based. So there's only power ground and then CAN high and low. There's four wires that go to the keypad and it controls everything in the car as far as like the driver input. And then the dash, it's got power ground and then a CAN high and low from the AEM system and a CAN high and low from the MoTeC system. And everything else is it, and that's it. So it makes the cars easier to wire and more reliable at the same time. We haven't built a car with relays in eight years probably. Uh, same thing with the battery. The battery, try to mount it low and midship. So the battery is inside this, this box right there. So again, midship and, and low. Just enough room for the passenger. Are you running a lithium battery? We are, yeah. We've got a little lithium battery and it's crazy. You get the lithium battery and you're like, I think they forgot to put something in it. But it, it starts the car really well and it's been reliable so far. Yeah, so I think we went from a 20 pound battery to a six traditional battery is what we used to rent a six pound lithium battery and it's, it's, I mean, I don't know how else you get 14 pounds off a car for $600. Yeah, another trick thing is we use a stock dash and we've got this keypad we wanted to mount. So we actually 3D printed the mount for it. So that's actually straight off the printer. This is kind of like my, my dream car. It's, it's, it's really, really well executed. Like everything stiff builds. Um, well, thanks for letting us look at the car. Um, you want to show us some things with the engine? Sure. We've got a couple engines that are pulled apart that are going to be rebuilt, called it. Uh, so this one is out of Castro's car. This is like the older setup. Um, they all look pretty similar. But yeah, is there anything specific you wanted to, to look at? Like this was a wet sump engine, and the other one is a, a dry sump engine. Uh, well, you use Carrillo rods, right? We do. And uh, JE pistons? Yes. And um, your block is basically a stock Toyota block, but you, uh, you go to a billet uh, main cap and girdle assembly, right? Yeah, so it's pretty cool. Like I can, just so you get an idea, I mean, this is, this is one of our blocks. It's, it's that light. See how light it is? I think it's 40 pounds or something like that, if that. I mean, Steph has some guns and he works out and stuff, but like, I'll pick this up with my, my old ass and one arm. I mean, look how light that is. It's like less than a dumbbell. It's totally amazing. And then we've gone, uh, so now we're running uh, Bryant cranks as well. Mm -hmm. And that's something that uh, as we got over like the 800, 900 horsepower and over, the main thing with RPM, the stock cranks would start twisting up and we'd have reliability issues, not reliability issues, but you'd start wearing the number four and five main bearings. Mm -hmm. And then we went to a Bryant crank and I said, just make us the strongest thing that you can make <laughs> for, you know, give me a 1400 horsepower crank. And the crank is actually almost 10 pounds heavier, just the crank, mm -hmm. but it's super st solid. And the main bearings all come out looking perfect now. So uh, that was one of the changes that we've done um, along with going to dry sump. When you have a super long stroke, so your piston speeds must be incredible. Yeah, it's 106 millimeter stroke running uh, 9,000 RPM. Yeah. How long do your rings last? Uh, they don't wear out. I don't know. Yeah. We just, we, we, the weak point in the engine is uh, the head gasket. So um, not the head gasket, but the, the as, I'll tell you a little story. Like as we've gone and made more power over the years, you figure out the, all of the weak points, right? Larger studs, better material. Um, but the, the limit now is we're actually flexing the cylinder head casting. Mm -hmm. So we're working on ways of trying to uh, make that head stronger. Um, so we run pins now from the top of the head down through the coolant passage holding 
uh, call it the, the, the head surface mm -hmm. stiffer onto the block. That's a drag racing trick, right? Yeah, I think old uh, uh, rally stuff. This stuff that the engine builders don't really talk about, um, but that's something that, that's worked well for us. Uh, you know, like the piston speeds, like when I used to do stuff with Nissan, um, as we exceeded um, like a 95 millimeter stroke, our ring life would be greatly decreased because the piston speeds were so high. And it's amazing that you know, you're, you're hitting way higher piston speeds, but your engine is so reliable. Yeah, um, the limit, the, the amount of time it spends at 9,000 is not that much compared to like a road race car or something. So, you know, these cars idle a lot, but they're not at full throttle that much. So that, that could be it. It's just the amount of hours at full throttle is just relatively low. I mean, I mean like 106 is the craziest Honda drag racing motor. I think they're going more than that nowadays, actually. More than 106? Yeah, I don't wow. think they talk about it, but I'm hearing numbers <coughs> from like 108 or more. Uh, I could see kind of the wear pattern on the bearing, and that's kind of like... This one was really bad. I think actually this was with the new build. Mm -hmm. So I think something was in some, one of the lines and went through. Because if you look at the wear, that's actually not from... See how it's only on part of it, but it didn't get the whole thing? Mm -hmm. That's not from the crank touching it. That's from something going through the oiling system. I, I was always amazed, too, like how much uh, legs you can get out of a, a wet sub system. I mean, you've only started going to dry sump in the past uh, couple years, right? Yeah, the limit of the wet sump is RPM at this point. So over 82, 8400, the wet sump has trouble keeping up. It'll really foam up the oil, and uh, the oil temperatures get really high, and they're hard to keep control of. And, the, and once we went to wet sump, the oil temps drop like 60 degrees and... and uh, what do you mean dry oil. sump? Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> once we went to dry sump, then the oil temps dropped. Um, and we didn't have these losses of, of pressure at certain parts of the track. Because what we would do is the wet sump, we would just keep adding more oil. Because I don't care if the oil is at the crankshaft when it's parked. Mm -hmm. The reality is when it's going around the track, most of the oil's up in the head. Mm -hmm. But at some point, you just keep adding oil and you just the crank is just... You, you get this giant donut of oil basically just flinging around inside the crankcase. And, you, uh, you didn't have uh, out of control oil temps? Because I was experimenting with stuff like that and I noticed that once I reached a certain oil level, like it depends on the engines, but uh, you know, like half a quart or a quart more sometimes, the, I think the crank actually starts hitting the oil and starts frothing it up and then the oil temps go really high. Yeah, I, I, I have a guru that I talk to, and the theory is that it's not necessarily, it, it is going and punching through the oil, but because of the, the um, surface tension, mm -hmm. right, you, you end up with this big donut of oil around, around the crankshaft. It's actually like all sticking to each other. So it's coming through, and it's not just splashing, it's picking it up. And you end up just flinging it around, and it's just a total disaster in there. That's why you get the temps so high. Uh, and the dry sum fixed. We were having out of... Uh, control oil temps, and then they'll dry some, knock them back down. And, and temperature-wise, out of control was 280 degrees. That was on the high end, and now we're back in the 220 degree range with no oil cooler. I, I know that bearing material starts to lose strength at about 260, so that, yeah, that was getting kind of up there. Yeah, and we run all coated bearings, so that, that bearing issues was, wasn't really an issue. It's just... Uh, um, Honestly, it really just kind of came down to the numbers. It, interesting story. Like, you'd look at the numbers, and we'd see 270 oil temps. We'd see, like, drops in pressure at certain parts of the track. Mm -hmm. And I'd be super scared, and we'd analyze the oil after every run. We'd send it out, and, and there'd be no bearing material in, in, the, in the, the sample. Um, and we'd pull the engine apart. It actually looked really good. Uh, but, you know, we just figured this is, if we want to continue to progress, this mm -hmm. is going to be a limiter at some point. Uh, but... You know, sometimes just seeing the high numbers and, and, and even dips in oil pressure didn't necessarily lead to failures. I mean, we found that a dry sump makes a huge difference in, in reliability. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of times the domestic engines, the, oil, the stock oiling systems aren't as refined to begin with. Mm. So we reach the limitations of the stock oiling system really quick. Yeah. Um, and I'm con contradicting myself a little bit because I said we'll go to the... the We'll go to the dry sump because it was so much better, but at the same time, we weren't really having a problem with the, the wet sump, other than looking at some of the numbers were not what we wanted on the data logs. Um, but it has more to do with just kind of being able to 
continue to progress. We figured that dry sump was the right way to go. Uh, you're, you're running Calico bearings? We run Toyota main bearings. Uh, they're actually coated from the factory, mm -hmm. from these engines. And then we run Calico uh, rod bearings. Mm -hmm. They're actually a two inch journal small block Chevy. Mm -hmm. And we have them narrowed and chamfered from Calico and then coated okay. uh, to our spec. And uh, they're a tri-metal type bearing? They're an ACL race oh, okay. bearing. Um, I'm not sure of the construction. Oh, okay. Um, and you're running uh, four scavenge stages and one pressure? Yep, so I'll show you a pan. So this is uh, so this is one of our oil pans. And the way this is set up is it's designed that each one of these cavities is one of the cylinders. Mm -hmm. And as the crank is flinging all the oil around, these little ports are just, they suck up the oil for each one. Oh, okay. And there's something you, you, that I didn't understand until I really started building and, and designing, helping my guru was helping me with design on this oil system, was that um, if what I wanted to do originally was run, run just one or two scavenges and have them go to these several ports. Right. But the way that these scavenge pumps work is they will continue to pull from wherever the air is, not where the oil is, because okay. it's the path of least resistance, right? Okay. So if we had all of these scavenges going to just one common plenum, and there was oil in these three, and air here, it's just going to pull all the air. Uh. It's not going to want to pull the oil until the oil gets covering all of them and then it can start pulling from all of them. So that's why in these race engines you'll see so many different stages mm -hmm. and then even one in the head is because you need it to pull from each one of those places individually. If it's not individual, it's going to go to the easiest place to suck and that's typically where there isn't any oil and just the air. I know on our motor we run f uh, five scavenge stages, like uh, four for the crank and then one for the turbo because our turbo is mounted really low. Yeah, we run that on the uh, that I do TN. So this is like a so this is the, the manifold for yeah, this, the. Yep. So because of the how this this bolts on mm -hmm. is really complex. Um, so these are those little suction scavenges. This is a drain from the head. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, and you have to have that detachable so you can bolt the pan on, I exactly. guess. Exactly. Right? And this is where the turbo comes in. Oh, okay. So we do share a little bit of the, the scavenging stages, so it's not, call it perfect. Um, but I don't think that's a, a, a real problem here. And I, I noticed this pan is like really uh, rigid and stiff. And did you design the pan to kind of help tie in the bottom of the block and give the block more integrity? and? Uh, resistance to twist and bending and all that? Yep, so the factory has this whole lower girdle. It's like a mid-pan sort of thing. They call it the stiffener. Mm -hmm. um, and it does that. It helps stiffen up the whole block. So we wanted to make sure that we could keep some of that stiffness in the low end as we took that factory part off and put our, our pan on. So this, I mean, this is a billet pan. It starts as a giant hunk of aluminum. And we have to machine it from, you know, 100 and something pounds down to, you know, 14 pound pan. Um, the other thing that I think is really trick on your motors is your shaft rocker system. Do you have that around or is it uh... Okay, so factory, the way this works is these lifters go in and you can shim underneath it and then the rockers go on which activate the valves and the cam sits up here and that's how it pushes the valve down. I can't push it down because these springs are too too stiff right now. But they can also, they can potentially fall off, right? So the, the way we change it is, actually I'll leave these on there. How we change it is we put in a little cradle, a little cradle. And this. And that gets bolted on. There's usually two. Um, and there's a roller here. And then it activates it, but it can't fall off anymore. So that's the fix for it. And we only use it on the exhaust side. The exhaust is the only side that has the issue. I think that's some great innovation right there. It's really impressive. Oh, thank you. You want to show us some of your new toys in the machine shop? Yeah, let's go. Yes, yeah, so, so back here is the machine shop area. We're actually not building anything today. It's actually pretty clean. Um, so we've got a manual mill, manual lathe, which if 
you've got a race team, you've got to have a manual lathe. I mean, just making spacers and just so much stuff we use on the lathe. Um, and then we have the CNC lathe and then CNC mill. Uh, the lathe is a 1999 Daewoo. Mm -hmm. And it's a relatively small footprint, but it has an eight inch chuck in it. And then the Fadal is a 94. Mm -hmm. um, and, it's, and it's relatively big. It's a 40 inch by 20 inch by, I think it's like 20 inch on the Z. So we can put relatively large, we can build relatively large parts. Um, and they're both, I got them both used. That's how we're able to afford them. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and yeah, at this point, we I mean, can make anything. We make, uh, we can make pulleys, we make our brake rotor hats, we make the oil pan, we make suspension components. I mean, there's so much stuff that we're able to make that, well, the machines essentially pay for themselves because we'd be spending thousands of dollars at a time of having the stuff manufactured. Right. And then in addition to that, it takes weeks to have the stuff built. And because we're building such one-off parts and, and we don't have a whole engineering team, um, sometimes we can make mistakes on the design end. Mm -hmm. And having the manufacturing here and the car that's going on all in the same place, we can spot errors with the design early and then make changes to the design and then just have this constant, um, we can evolve things very quickly. Uh, and, and that's almost necessary. I'm sure you've gotten stuff back from the machine shop and you're like, oh, it doesn't fit perfect. And More often than I care to admit. Yeah, so that, that's, that's super common, yeah. So, God, I got machine shop envy too. <laughs> so, um, there we go. We get a tour of Papadakis Racing. We get to look at cars. We get to look at trick stuff. Uh, thank you very much for letting us look at all this and uh, giving me ideas to help me beat you. <laughs> Anytime, Mike. All right. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you.